you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them to our scripture reading in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. If you're able, stand with me as we read from God's Word. The 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And we'll begin reading at verse 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto them, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Amen. Praise, Praise God. God. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bow our heads for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Would you speak to us from it this morning, and for that we will thank you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading finds Jesus headed for Jerusalem. He's going there for the final time in his earthly life. He knows he's headed for his date with the cross. Knowing this, notice what it says about him in verse 32. It says, Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. Why are they amazed? Well, they're amazed at how bold he is. He is leading the way. He's before them. He's not dragging his feet. Many thousands and hundreds of thousands have gone to their death like to a cross or a firing squad or the gallows or the electric chair or, or whatever, screaming and hollering and somebody even having to drag them <coughs> to it. But not Jesus. Just like a captain out front leading a charge, he's right in the front. <coughs> showing us that he is truly the captain of our salvation. And they are amazed at his courage, knowing that he is headed for an encounter with his foes. He's doing it in heroic fashion, showing courage that they can hardly believe that a man can show. But instead of mimicking what they see in Jesus, they were afraid. They're apprehensive about the danger that they may be in themselves. Now Jesus' courage should have given them courage. It, it always should give us courage. For whatever we face. But it didn't. Whenever I'm going through some kind of a hard time, it's very encouraging for me to know that Jesus is out ahead. He's going on before me to help me to deal with whatever it is that is up ahead. And it ought to be encouraging to you, whatever it is you're dealing with. If you know Jesus... He's out ahead already, paving the way, preparing the way for you. 
The hymn says, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. That's the kind of courage Jesus going before us can give us. But not the disciples. It says they were afraid instead. Now apparently there were two groups with Jesus within this main group that are traveling with the twelve as well as another party of followers. And verse 32 says, Jesus takes the twelve aside from the others to talk to them about these things. And notice what method he uses to talk to them to silence their fear. He doesn't try to make things look better than what they were. That's what people do a lot of times. He didn't give them a speech about looking on the bright side of things. He didn't set them down and say, now you boys need to start talk, thinking positive. He didn't give them false hope that maybe he, what he's about to tell them won't happen. I'll escape. He tells them again in plain words what he had told them before. The things that are going to happen to him. He tells them, verses 33 and 34, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and here's what's going to happen when we get there. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. They're going to condemn me to death. They're going to deliver me to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me, scourge me, spit upon me, kill me. But ah, the third day, I'm going to rise again. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Now this wasn't the first time he told them this. But like a lot of people, they only hear what they want to hear. And this had not yet sunk in, apparently, with them. In Mark 8, 31-33, he tried to tell them this. But if you remember that incident, Peter rebuked him for doing it. And this is the place where Jesus in turn rebukes Peter saying, Get behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And after that in Mark 9, 30-32, he tried to tell them these things. But verse 32 says, but they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him anything further. Have you ever tried to have a serious talk with somebody and they don't grasp what you're saying? Very frustrating, <coughs> isn't it? You know somewhat of the frustration then that preachers have as they try to get people to see things that they either can't or won't see. And you know something of the frustration Jesus must have had with them. He pulls no punches. He knows the matter has already been determined. He knows these things can't be avoided. Because this is what he's sent here to do. So as he tells them what's going to happen to him, he gets even more specific this time than other times. He has perfect foresight of what is going to happen. Remember, he's God. He knew before even he came to earth that this is what he was going to be involved in. And he goes into detail about the circumstances that are going to accompany his death. As he tells them, I'm sure he can, 
I'm sure he can already hear the abusive language that is going to be used against him in his mind. He knows, maybe can already feel the spit on his face. Being beaten. He's feeling it already. He knows he's going to have his precious beard plucked out by the roots. He maybe can already feel that crown of thorns being shoved down upon his head as they mock him. He knows to add insult to injury that his own people are going to choose to have a murderer named Barabbas free when it could have been him. And he knows the Romans are going to nail him to a cross. He knows all this right down to the smallest detail of what awaits him in Jerusalem. Yet he willingly goes forth to face it all. Willingly. Now one can only say when you see this, what courage. How perplexing it must have been to Jesus. As Luke 18.34 in describing the same incident said, the disciples understood or understand none of these things. But worse than not understanding, the twelve continue with their scheming for advantage. You read on there in Luke, you'll discover that the next <coughs> verses contained James and John's request to sit at Jesus' left and right hand. Now we can't say for certain that these are the next words to come out of his mouth. But Matthew 20, 17 through 21, in recording this same incident, also places James and John's request <coughs> right after this as well. Now, if you were Jesus, put yourself in his shoes. If you were Jesus, wouldn't you want to hear from the disciples something like, we're with you, Jesus. We're right behind you. Is there anything we can do to help you or to make this easier? Of course you would. I know I'm the human leader of this church. Of course, Jesus is the real leader. I take my orders from him. But as the human leader, if I'm going to stick my neck out for you guys, it would be nice to know that you're behind me and that you appreciate what I'm doing. Amen. And I'm glad I do feel that way about you. But Jesus gets none of that. He's all alone in this. Instead of understanding and backing, he has to deal with petty bickering among them. Instead. And yet, on to Jerusalem he goes. To climb Calvary's hill. <coughs> all alone. Now of the twelve, we only have record of one of them being right there at the cross with Jesus. That was John. He too had fled with the others earlier, but he made his way to the scene of the cross, and while he was there, John 19 tells us that Jesus asked him to care for his mother. I'm sure that meant something to Jesus to at least 
I've had one of the twelve, even if it was only one by his side. And yet how troubling it must have been to him to know that as he climbs Mount Calvary to be crucified, <coughs> Judas is hanging himself. How frustrating it must have been to him to know that he's dying to bring victory over sin and death, and yet he's losing one of the twelve at the very same time. So there hangs Jesus on the cross, knowing Judas has just hung himself, and now John, the only one who was at least there, has taken his mother back to the house and he's left alone. But he still has his father. Amen. Right? Yep, amen. But as darkness covers the land, one of the most gut-wrenching cries in history is heard from the cross. As Jesus screams, Eloi, Eloi, the mux, the mux, the nigh. Which interpreted means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now I'm not sure I'll ever fully understand all that <coughs> that involved. This side of heaven. But I understand this. Never before, nor ever since, has any person ever felt as lonely as Jesus felt that moment. Yeah. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul explains the cause of his loneliness. This is what he said. For he hath made him to be sin for us yep. who knew no sin that he might be made the righteousness of God or that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Galatians 3.13 says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. <coughs> Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23 said that when a criminal was executed as the law required for certain crimes, he was then hung on a tree as a sign of disgrace. A public decoration that he had broken the law and was therefore a curse of God. So according to the law and according to everything that happened, as Jesus hangs on the tree that day, he is considered Accursed, the sinless Son of God, accursed of God. That dreadful day, he took on his shoulders the burden of the world's sin. He who had never known sin himself had every dirty, rotten thing that men have ever done placed on his shoulders. Every dirty, rotten thing you ever did was placed squarely on his shoulders. You talk about feeling lonely. That moment, the Lamb of God becomes the scapegoat of the Levitical law. Remember the scapegoat? Mm -hmm. 
Leviticus 16, 21 through 22 said, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat go into the wilderness. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would confess the sins of the people <coughs> over the scapegoat, symbolically placing them upon the scapegoat's head. And the scapegoat was then sent out into the wilderness alone. Make sure you get that alone part. To bear the iniquities of the people by itself <clears throat> and to be killed by whatever it was, a bear, a lion, whatever, that came upon an unprotected goat. Jesus felt what that goat felt. As even the Father turns his back and lets Jesus to bear the sins of mankind alone. Let that sink in. Alone. Now, you may never fully understand all the theological ramifications of that. Don't feel bad. I don't, haven't got that all yet myself. But understand this. No one ever felt more alone than what Jesus did when he cried, My God, my God. God, why hast thou forsaken me? Loneliness to the tenth degree. So what do I want us to see from this this morning? I want us to see Jesus' courage. I want you to see his boldness that would not shrink back from the task at hand. I want you to try to feel the absolute loneliness and total abandonment he must have felt. And I want you to see that he was willing to do this not because he was forced to do so, or because, as the psychological teaching in the church now says, because you were worth it. No. He was willing to do this not because he was forced to, but because he was so full of love for you. Amen. and me that he could do nothing else. As they started for Jerusalem that day, Jesus could have turned around and went the other way. Most of us, if we knew that was up ahead for us, would have turned around and done just that. Went the other way. But not Jesus. He boldly went before them. With a courage, Mark says, that amazed them. Why? 
again, just for one reason, his love for you and for me. Amen. Not because you were worth it. Not because he had to. He volunteered to do it. Because he loved you that much. My friend, I challenge you to ask yourself, somebody that loves you that much, how can you do anything less than try to love him back? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that realistically. A lot of people say, oh, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't care about Jesus. And Ted Turner one time said, I never asked nobody to die for me. Mm -hmm. Well, Ted may have never asked anybody to die for him, but I never asked anybody to die for me either, but I'm sure glad somebody did. Amen. Amen. He loves you. Do you love him back? Let's stand. <coughs> Bow our heads for just a moment. And I want you to just let that sink in for just a moment. Why the cross? Just one reason. Because Jesus loved you so much, he couldn't do anything but go in there for you. So how can you do anything less than love him back? Let's join together in a closing word of prayer. Jeff,